Welcome to the Brainiac Podcast Expert Talk Series, Mind the Brain. I'm your host, Nikita Nambiar, an incoming freshman at Barnard College of Columbia University and a neuroscience enthusiast. And this week, I got to speak with the incredible Dr. Hameda Kandakar. Dr. Kandakar is a senior medical writer and is a professor of neuroscience, having taught at Hunter College, Columbia University, and West Brooklyn Community High School. She has researched extensively on the neurological effects of dietary curcumin, or as we know it, turmeric, and its effects on neurogenesis-dependent learning and stress, among many other things. During this episode of Mind the Brain, we delve into some really interesting topics, including what it's like to be a woman in STEM in the 21st century, and how high schoolers interested in research can find research opportunities. Stick around to the end of the video to learn more about really interesting facets of graduate school and academia, especially if you're interested in the cognitive sciences or the brain sciences. So without further ado, let's move on to the interview. I hope you guys enjoy it. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the next episode of Mind the Brain, now a Brainiac podcast initiative. I'm sitting today with Dr. Hameda Kandakar. Thank you so much for joining us. This is such an honor for me to be able to speak with you, especially since I've done classes with you and I know what an amazing person you are both in the classroom and outside. So I have a couple of questions. Um, and you know, to start off, I was wondering if you could introduce the research that you've done and if there are any interesting findings that you've had from all this research that you conducted. All right. Well, first of all, thank you for um, bringing me along into this podcast. I'm thrilled to be a part of it, um, only because oftentimes when you get into the nitty gritty of things, it's hard not to focus on work. And this is kind of like a nice, um, refreshing relaxer for um, scientists to always be involved in because we forget oftentimes that not only are we conducting research and conducting work, but there's an opportunity to give back as well. So I'm really happy to be here today with you. Um, now, in terms of the, the research that I conducted um, during my graduate career, I'm a little bit of, uh, in a unique situation because I did start off studying academia and I got my PhD in graduate research, but now I'm more inside of the industry aspect of things and that's something that I'll get to a little later. But um, regarding my graduate school career, I actually had the pleasure of working with Dr. Glenn Schaaf and Dr. Nisha Burkhart, Burkhart, who are both at Hunter College, which is a CUNY University in New York. Um, and the general topics that we ended up um, studying in that lab were things like curcumin, which is the active ingredient in your common household Indian spice turmeric, which is interesting. Um, but the labs were generally um, interested in things like chronic stress and the effects of chronic stress we looked at memories and in particular fear memories, and we tried to answer questions surrounding these different topics in an animal model. So Dr. Glenn Schaaf works particularly with rats and Dr. Nisha Burkhart works with mouse models. And the reason why we work with animal models to try to study neuroscience is to kind of get a little deeper into understanding some questions regarding like any neurological events, the molecular, the molecular pathways that are involved, the neurotransmitters that are involved, and anything that um, is related to how chronic stress manifests in the brain and how it may impact memory later. So with my graduate career, I was actually very interested in um, Dr. Schaaf first. And from Dr. Schaaf, I was able to work with Dr. Nisha Burkhart. And finally, at the very end, my dissertation thesis was basically looking at the effects of chronic or long-term administration of dietary curcumin specifically. So this is curcumin that you can eat, not curcumin that's often injected, which in the pharmacological world is usually what happens and how we study it in an animal model. But we looked at the effects of long-term dietary curcumin administration on hippocampal dependent memories and different types of hippocampal dependent memories. Um, and memory we know from so much research in um, neuroscience um, is heavily invested in a region of the brain called the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is a huge memory processing center of the brain. Oftentimes, and earlier on in research, we always assumed that that's where all of the memories are stored. But now we know it's just the beginning portions of that whole big complicated memory process that we still have a lot to learn about. Um, and we understood the effects of curcumin on specific fear-based memories in the hippocampus of a mouse model. And again, we chose a mouse model so that we can get a little deeper in terms of understanding what's going on in the hippocampus in relation to memory 
and in relation to curcumin as well. And so for my actual dissertation thesis, what we did was explore two different types of uh, memories. We worked on neurogenesis dependent memories and hippocampal dependent memories. Now hippocampal dependent memories are gonna be like general memories like memorization, things like that. Whereas neurogenesis dependent memories are gonna take that a little step further and kind of test you on your cognitive flexibility. So whenever there's some, any kind of flexibility involved in recognizing the difference between two memories, that's when neurogenesis is going to come on board specifically in the hippocampus. So the hippocampus can process general memory, but whenever you have to like remember something that are very similar, like, you know, like being able to determine whether you saw twin one or twin two yesterday, your cognitive flexibility is gonna kind of help you discern that. And again, I'm saying that very loosely, but to get you an idea of what I mean by flexibility. So now we have two different types of memory. We have a mouse model. I wanna see whether or not curcumin can interfere with those memory processes, whether it's a hippocampal dependent memory or a neurogenesis dependent memory. And from there, see if it has any positive or negative effects. So what is curcumin doing? And the reason why we chose curcumin is because it's been well studied by um, Dr. Shafe, and he studied it under the context of chronic stress. So I wanted to you know, kind of take a step back and see what it does to memory in general and what pathways and what neurotransmitters, so on and so forth are involved. At the very end of all of that research, which took days and weekends and months and a lot of writing and a lot of reading, um, what we found was really interesting in that the length of time in which you take curcumin in a mouse model, um, the length of time that it took to, um, to ingest curcumin, the longer you take it, the more of a positive effect it had. Um, and the positive effects it has was specifically on neurogenesis dependent memories. So what we did was we compared five days of dietary curcumin versus 28 days of dietary curcumin. And the reason that that difference in time is really important to recognize is that when we talk about neurogenesis dependent memories, it usually takes around a month for that new neuron to kick in and start actually connecting with the already existing circuits in the hippocampus. So it seems to be this particular process and this particular pathway of neurogenesis that curcumin was affecting simply because we found that curcumin wasn't affecting regular memory and memorization, but this cognitive flexibility aspect of it. And from there, we then decided to take it a step further. Like, all right, so it's 28 days of curcumin. It's a neurogenesis dependent memory. How can we continue to test different types of cognitive flexibility over short-term periods and long-term periods to really truly understand it, its effects? Um, and then we also looked at different portions of the hippocampus because again, there's so much research out there now that we're getting more and more minute details about this region and the dorsal um, portion and the ventral portion, specifically of the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus that's particularly involved in um, neurogenesis can have differential effects. And we ended up looking at that too, like different portions of the dentate gyrus. Are there more cells being activated here versus here? Because research has shown that the dorsal portion and the ventral portion are involved in different aspects of memory there as well. One's more emotional and one's more cognitive flexibility. And so those are many ways that you can start answering some of these kinds of questions in your graduate school career. And one thing I realized is the question that you start off with is never really the question that you end up answering. And in all, you have to let your data speak to you. So by the very end, although we looked at many different things like BDNF, um, which is a neuroprotective molecule in the brain, we looked at ARC, which is an immediate early gene that's often related to short-term memory and long-term memory. We looked at all of this and unfortunately didn't really see a lot of results on the molecular aspect, but there were very distinct differences between animals that took curcumin and animals that didn't on the behavioral aspect. So we may not be answering the question right right now. We know we got one question answered that these molecules don't really necessarily seem to be involved in the specific type of memory that curcumin is affecting and Maybe it makes sense as to why it's affecting flexibility over regular memory because it's an anti-inflammatory and maybe the pathways that it's targeting are more specific to those kinds of things in the brain. And that's where I ended up leaving my research off before you know, um, transitioning careers, but basically looking at the effects of long-term curcumin. And the question that I usually get at the very end every single time that I explain this thesis 
is, you know, where can I get my hands on curcumin or how much curcumin do I have to take? What if I want to fix my memory? And one really important thing to remember is oftentimes the translation of research is very difficult. So we're human beings. And in that sense, we're definitely going to have to take a lot more curcumin than your general everyday mouse is going to have to take to see those benefits. And on top of that, in terms of translating, um, you know, medicine in this particular case, the amount of curcumin that we have to take is a lot. <laughs> and it's not something that we can like stuff and heavily concentrate in like a pill. And then on top of that, the bioabsorption of curcumin in a human um, model is um, a little low as well. So we got to think about those kinds of things once we figure this out in a mouse model. And oftentimes just answering questions on the molecular level isn't enough because at the very end, the target population is us. We're trying to figure out, you know, uh, more things about our memories, about things like PTSD, for example, chronic stress and all of those effects. Um, and that's where I ended up learning as well. Yeah, that's, that's extremely fascinating. And I was hoping that somewhere my South Indian diet filled with turmeric would hopefully boost my memory, but <laughs> I guess not. Um, you brought up a really interesting point when you were, when you just started speaking, which is that you were interested in academia. And I'm also really interested in academia. I hope to go down the research route, maybe become a professor one day. Let's see where the future takes me. But how did you know that that's what you were interested in? How did you decide that academia was meant for you? So I, again, um, was in a very unique situation in my academic career. And um, like many students, probably when I was transitioning from my undergraduate career to my graduate career, even in my undergraduate career, I had no idea what I really wanted to do. I definitely uh, chose psychology as my major. And I think a lot of this had to do with my exposure to different sciences. And psychology is where I ended up in because I ended up taking AP psychology in my last year of high school. So it kind of really interested me. And we started delving a little bit deeper and deeper into some of these concepts. And I thought, you know what? I'm gonna become a therapist. You know, everybody loves talking to me. I'm very sociable in that aspect. And everybody keeps saying, hey, this might be like the perfect role for you. And oftentimes that's like the, the stereotypical pathway to go down. If I'm studying psychology, let me become a therapist because what else am I gonna do with psychology if not become a teacher or a therapist? And I was getting more and more interested in it. And then I realized that like, it wasn't enough. Like it, it it's just the behavior, like how we can explain behavior, but how do we interfere with it? You know, what's causing it? And then I ended up taking philosophy classes as well, because I really needed to understand where all of these abstract things come from, because very much in psychology, everything's still very hypothetical. Everything's still very theoretical as well. Um, and then in my undergraduate career, I got really lucky of being introduced to this program called BP Endor. Um, and BP Endor is basically a research initiative for undergraduate minority students. And so I applied um, really quickly and um, I got accepted eventually as well. And what this program does is it helps fund undergraduate students of minorities um, to conduct research, both in their home university over the spring and fall semesters. And then you get two summer rotations in universities outside of your state. So I had the pleasure of going to the University of Michigan to conduct some research and Vanderbilt University as well to conduct some research. And it, it was honestly that program that opened the door to neuroscience for me. Um, it wasn't something I was thinking about. It wasn't something I even thought existed even with my psychology you know, classes. And basically it's the merging of the psychology field with the biology field. And I thought not only is this going to be great for me, this is going to be really great for my parents who always want me to become doctors because that's like the typical thing that they always try to put you on. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to get the best of both worlds here. I get to study what I want. Um, I'll figure out biology at some point, you know, to understand neuroscience. And it was really approachable. It was a lot more approachable than I expected. I actually think that the, the science behind plants and all of those other things that they teach you in biology is a lot more complicated than what I've learned about the brain in my career. And, and so from there, I got really excited about it. And that program really, really, really helps give you a nice stepping stool into your graduate career and understanding exactly what neuroscience research looks like. And they make it really approachable for undergraduate students. And then you get really surprised as to how many labs out there have tons and tons of undergraduate students because that's the people that are doing most of their work for the lab, you know, and we end up on publications, we end up on posters and things like that. And so that's what really inspired me to go into neuroscience. But on the other hand, what inspired me to um, look at 
curcumin specifically um, in the lab, I'm not really sure if I was ever inspired to look at curcumin specifically. Oftentimes it is a, a stereotypical joke that it's, it kind of ended up like me search because I do come from uh, Bengali and an Indian background. So it's like, hey, maybe you're just trying to understand what's in your mom's cabinet. But to be honest, when I had started my career, I was more interested in things like affective disorders, like depression, anxiety, PTSD, and stress in particular. I was always, 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 always interested in more preventative medicine than restorative medicine, which is why curcumin initially had attracted me. But uh, even before curcumin attracted me, what really, really, really attracted me was Dr. Shaif. Um, the work that he was doing, his approach to his work, and the whole world of PTSD that he introduced me to, uh, with his graduate student at the time, who's now Dr. Miguel Briones, and also my lifelong um, friend as well, a lot of that came from the people that were in the lab, and then I slowly got uh, more and more interested in the concepts we were learning there. So because of Dr. Shafe, I kind of grew my interest. And then from Dr. Shafe is when I met Dr. Nisha Burkhardt, who had her own set of interests that also interested me a lot more and had a different approach to things and brought in that concept of neurogenesis with everything. And then I just took it from there. So I wasn't necessarily interested in neuroscience. I wasn't necessarily interested in curcumin. It's just where my pathway ended up taking me. And it's really interesting that I had no idea that my high school AP psychology class will then bring me through academia and back out into the world of industry, which is something that I also never expected to be in as well. I feel like that's really comforting to know because I've always like struggled with, should I be deciding what my major is already? Do I know if neuroscience is for me? Is it psychology? Is it, I, I'm questioning all my decisions that I've made so far in regards to my major, especially now that I'm going into college. So it's great to know that you've also, you know, had a journey to understand that this is where you want to be. Um, one thing you spoke about right now is research. And Finding research opportunities, I feel, can sometimes be challenging for high schoolers. So how would you say the best way to tackle that is? How can we find internships with professors? So I will kind of reiterate that and be a little realistic and say that it is very difficult for high school students to get into any kind of research lab, whether it's a human-based lab or an um, animal-based lab. And the best piece of advice that I can offer is basically look around to see if there are any new initiatives that high school principals and teachers are starting to get high schoolers more and more involved in research. Um, I also had the pleasure of working in a program that was sponsored by NYU called, uh, I'm gonna forget this, I think Brainwaves. Yes, I, I believe it was called Brainwaves. And it was a very clever name for the program that actually ended up going to different high schools and actually starting a neuroscience class there where for the very end of that class, those students needed to create an experiment based off of an EEG experiment. And EEG is a way of measuring like brain activity on the surface level. And they purchased a bunch of like portable EEGs and they had graduate students like myself also be a part of the program to go to these classes to help conduct the research with them. And that's one way that was like a first look into how research is done for high school students to start thinking about how the scientific method actually gets um, applied in the world of neuroscience. But outside of any kind of school sponsored initiatives, it's very difficult to get in. And the reason for that has a lot to do with paperwork <laughs> because oftentimes going into a lab you're going to need some kind of training and high school students are usually under 18 and it gets much more difficult in that sense to to fill out the paperwork and there's also a lot of already different like roles and responsibilities that are already taken up by either the mentor which is the head of the lab there are postdocs and these are students who graduated after phd they're continuing their academic careers that's oftentimes the next step to go into there are tons of graduate students and then a ton of undergraduate students as well so there really isn't a need for anything outside of that, especially because once you get to the college environment, there's gonna be so many people waiting to join your lab that for mentors, high school students are often at the very end of the list. I did see one or two like trickle in um, randomly, but one thing I will say is that even though as a high school student, you can't necessarily end up in a lab, this is something that I say all the time, both in and outside of the classroom that as a student, you know, especially moving from the high school environment into the college environment, you have to be really, really, really like 
conscious about the fact that you need to remain an active participant in your choices. You need to remain an active participant in your future. And basically, you're not going to wait for a guidance counselor to send you a letter. You're not going to wait for the start of school announcement, to, you know, to remind you to do things. You have to be more proactive about your own things and keep your own checklist and stuff. And although neuro, like young high school neuroscientists can't necessarily join a lab right now, what you can do is start researching the schools you want to attend. And the schools that you want to attend, you should also keep in mind, if you're really, really, really like, you know, interested in research, what research is being done at this university? So you may find out that, hey, I'm interested in Harvard, Columbia, so on and so forth, but the research that's actually being done there now in real time isn't what I'm interested in. So is it really worth for me to go there? Yes, you know, it's very important as a high school student, I wanna go after names, but the names that you do wanna go after are not necessarily the school names, but the names of the professors that you want to end up working with. That's going to help you a lot more, depending again on how interested you are in research. But if you are interested in research, that name of the school is going to be the last thing on people's minds. They're going to want to know what work you did. They're going to want to know the field that you worked in. They're going to want to know the names that you worked in in that field. And so you can at least start getting yourself interested in, hey, I want to work with this professor at this school. Um, and then once you have that list set out and then you finally get into the schools that you've been accepted into, you can actually reach out during your interview process to be like, hey, I'm actually really interested in meeting this professor and so on and so forth. I'm not sure if that's something that you are necessarily exposed to as an undergraduate, but for your graduate school interviews, that's definitely something that you will be asked to do. So it's really good to start getting, um, you know, proactive about it as well. And then on top of that, you know, just, just reach out always send an email. It never, never hurts to send an email. The worst thing that's going to happen is they're going to say, sorry, we don't have space or sorry, we can't accommodate you or they won't reply. And that's the worst thing that could happen. And then you can move on and then you can continue to do that. Um, and you could always take classes. I feel like neuroscience is up and coming right now a little bit more in high school, way more than I was, I was exposed to in my high school career. So just, just continue researching and just continue being an active participant. And one of those darts are going to hit and you'll find one eventually. Yeah, that's actually great advice, especially about the graduate school. Um, yeah, I didn't know about that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and also I, feel like, also, I feel like another way to maybe ex for high schoolers to expose themselves to neuroscience, like you said, is through courses, because I did try to find internships, and it was so hard. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much no one responded back. But I was able to do the high school programs with Columbia, and I was able to do your course. And that was like my first introduction into neuroscience. And it was it was like a mixture of neuroscience and psychology because you were doing the neuroscience of psychiatric disorders and yeah. the bulb just clicked. And I feel like everyone needs that first exposure. So it's great that you brought that up. Yeah. Um, and even then, that course that I taught you, that's still just one niche of um, <laughs> neuroscience. And there's so much more I haven't taught you guys in that course. Yeah. So there's a lot out there. <laughs> yeah. Neuroscience is just a really expansive field, but I, I like to see it as like kind of an ultimate science because there's just so much that's part of it. There's physics, there's philosophy, there's psychology, there's math. It's, there's a little bit of everything. And yeah. I feel like that's why I love it so much because I, I can't really <laughs> stick to one subject. Um, Very similar. <laughs> <laughs> so I moving on actually to a different facet of, of who you are. You know, you're a professor, but you're also a senior medical writer. And I wanted to know what experience you think or what skills that you think are skill sets you think are important for, you know, someone who's interested in entering the scientific writing process? So senior medical writing, which is what my career is today, I'm a medical writer, is very different from the neuroscience research and the academic role that I was involved in. So after graduating my PhD career, I ended up working with, for a medical communications company called BGB Group. And from there, I learned what the world of industry behind, you know, neuroscience is. And I got really lucky with the account that I was on where um, I was actually looking at the fields of multiple sclerosis. And multiple sclerosis is also a brain disorder. And it's not something that I ever really thought about in the context of neuroscience ever. And um, what happens is in the field of medical communications, you work more um, directly with pharmaceutical companies. And the scientific writing process that goes on there has a lot to do with 
talking about specific drugs that are indicated for specific disorders like multiple sclerosis in this particular case and seeing you know what research is being conducted on it to continue to speak to the effects of that drug along with looking at you know the way that um, research is being conducted you know even after the launch or release of a drug how is it faring out there you know how are patients continuing to use this particular drug how are they you know what are the outcomes what are the efficacy outcomes what are the safety outcomes of this particular drug and basically we handle a lot of things both on the commercial and on the medical side of basically a drug so it's very different it's very you know pharmacy heavy which is a huge um, field also in neuroscience which is only increasing year by year so the field of studying drugs in neuroscience is pharmacology or neuropsychopharmacology and those names are always mixed around but the word neuro is going to be in it and the word pharma or psychology is going to be in it as well um, and from there i actually am switching gears now and i'm joining another company called vanium group um, soon. And so I'm going to continue my scientific medical writing process there under different indications, under different fields. Um, and it's actually going to be a huge step away from the field of neuroscience for me right now. But to bring it kind of back to neuroscience, you know, as a senior medical writer, I know it's a little different from the world that I was in. And, you know, what I will say that you know, when I mentioned before about being like an active participant in your choices and stuff, along with, you know, creating plans and actively creating plans for yourself, make sure you remember that um, to be a little bit flexible as well, you know, with your plans. And although that my current career is a little different from the world of neuroscience, when it comes to the scientific writing process in general, there's a method to a madness to all of those scientific articles that we read. And going in to try to figure out the intent of what your article is going to be, the intent of what your writing piece is going to be, is going to be really important to then understand, hey, this is how my audience needs to decipher my writing. So I need to keep this in mind to ensure that that particular message is being portrayed. So if you're trying to say something like, for example, most of the writing that happens in the field of neuroscience is usually at the end of an experiment whether it's for a thesis, whether it's for an article, a poster, so on and so forth. So how do I approach that? I did all of the, the experiments that I wanted to do. How do I now put it in writing form that's going to be accessible to those that are in my field so I can show off a little bit like, hey, this is what I found, but also in those outside of my field that are just doing it for say like a literature search or they're just trying to figure it out or they, my name popped up and they just wanna read it. And the one thing we want to always keep in mind in the scientific writing process, so this is not like poetry or fiction writing or anything specifically for scientific writing, that you always, always, always want to err on the side of caution. A lot of this is because we only know what we know, right? At the end of the day, that's it. And we want to ensure that anything that's coming out as claims, as results, or anything from our experiments are always taken with a little grain of salt. I think that's what the that's what the saying is. And basically know that when you're writing something out, you know that what I'm writing here in the name of science may not even be true. Because at one point we always thought that the world was flat and then all of a sudden more and more research came out and now we definitely know that the world is round. So again, being flexible in that aspect and making sure that that's portrayed in your writing. We never, never say that A causes B we always end up saying no matter how many years of research we conducted on it, A may be related to B, even after all of those years, because again, things could be flipped around. You know, all of the, all of the neurotransmitters that we've studied in class may not even be involved in what I taught you was involved in. And I always told you, I think I remember telling at the very end of my course, you might as well also just forget everything that I taught you just because we don't know where it's going to end up. I just know what I know from the textbooks that was given to me and who knows what's gonna be in the textbooks in the future. And this is why research and the field of research specifically in neuroscience is so important because it's going to help us become more and more confident in those answers that we're going to put that A may be related to B, for example. So keep that in mind and always, um, one thing that I was always taught, especially in the writing process was that causation does not equate, I mean, sorry, correlation does not equate causation. And that's something that I've been taught day in and day out in all of my scientific experiments. Hey, it worked, but that doesn't mean it's true. <laughs> I'm just one person who did the experiment once that got the results once. And oftentimes in research, you'll see that 
you know, repeating results is very difficult as well. You know, doing the same experiment again by the same person, you may not even get the same results twice. So always, always, always err on the side of caution. Um, and know that although things like creative writing are a little bit more like, hey, free form, and then you get really overwhelmed on how to write it, scientific writing will always be the same. There's always gonna be an introduction, there's always gonna be a method, there's always gonna be results. And depending on the kind of data that you look at, there's always one type of graph that can come out of it. So reading a lot of literature is going to help you write literature, specifically in the field of science. So that's where I would start if you're overwhelmed. Yeah, that's great to hear. Again, as someone who's interested in writing scientific material, yeah, I, I didn't have this type of like, I didn't have a mentor who would be able to guide me and stuff like that. So just being able to spread this message to our viewers as well is great. And we're so fortunate to be able to have you. So I have a question actually about, you, you spoke about standing out in your classes. And when I was going through my course registration a couple of days ago, I realized that there's a class of 400 kids in it. And I have no idea how I how I'd stand out in a class of 400 kids. So what are your what's your advice? How can I make myself unique? <laughs> so in college, which is very different from maybe your high school courses, is you'll realize, especially if you're going to colleges that are in city environments, the class number gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And I actually helped uh, be a teacher's assistant or a TA in my graduate school for a class that in the spring semester had 500 students, but in the fall semester had like 800 students um, with this professor of mine. So it was a lot. And then you ask yourself this question, dude, how is this professor ever going to remember me? I'm like sitting in an audience. I'm probably just a blur to this professor. And let's not think, you know, maybe on the scale of, you know, 800 or 300, maybe 200 or 100. So say you're in a class of 100 or 200 students, it can still be very difficult to try to stand out. You know, you gotta think about your time. You gotta think about all of the other classes that you're taking. You gotta figure out if there's always a line of students waiting to talk to the professor at the end of the class. You gotta also understand the professor's schedule as well. You know, if the professor is also involved in research, they're often jetting out of the classroom at the very end, you know, to go back to their research, to go back to their lab. They have office hours, they can teach multiple classes. So it gets more and more overwhelming to the point you're just like, you know what, I'm not even gonna try at all. But what you can try to do is always be creative when trying to approach them. And as a student in a college class, the goal isn't just to get the highest grade in the class. It's not going to mean anything because the professors are teaching the same class almost every single semester. And they're going to be like, all right, so three people got the highest grade or two people got the highest grade. You're just going to be a number at the end of the day for these professors, especially if the class is going to be big. And instead of just aiming for the highest grade, try, you know, like thinking outside the syllabus. What can you do that's not required of me? You know, can I visit office hours with my professor so that they at least see me? They see that I'm inquisitive. Can I go in asking questions? Can I get a little deeper in some of these conversations that we're having in class and in a college environment? you're not necessarily there to memorize information anymore. You're there to also learn how to apply and think critically in response to the information that's being taught to you. And professors will oftentimes, at least from my perspective, will appreciate if a student then comes back and it engages critical thinking portions of their brain. If they come to my office hours and ask me questions that are well beyond the scope of the class, because that's gonna show me motivation that's going to show me confidence. That's going to show me that they understand the material enough to not ask me basic questions, but to take it a step forward. And that's how you're going to stand out in office hours. Um, you could also keep in contact via email, depending on how um, you know busy your particular professor is. And oftentimes, if the professor isn't um, accessible, there's always going to be some kind of teaching assistance, especially in a class that big. And you can always try to get on their side. Um, you could also try to at least be like an outside participant in any labs that that professor might also be involved in. Like, hey, do you mind just like, I just want to be able to talk to your graduate students or I want to talk to the other undergraduates and see what that experience is like because I'm really interested in your research from what you've shown me in, you know, the class lectures, so on and so forth. Um, you could also invite them to do blogs and things like that. I'm sure that they'll definitely appreciate to do that because then you, you know, you're also kind of complimenting them by also, you know, exposing yourself 
as well in this particular manner. So always get creative. You know, you don't have to just limit it to communication. You could ask them, you know, from the very beginning of class, like, hey, I'm really interested in your course. I know we haven't sat down for any lectures yet, but I'm really interested. And I would really, really love, and I think it would be beneficial for me if I can get a recommendation for you at the end of this course. And if you ask that at the very beginning, they can help set up exactly what you need to do for yourself throughout the course in order to be like, hey, yeah, I can actually write you a recommendation. Because in a class of 200 students, if you go at the very end, it's gonna to be too late. You're not gonna know exactly what this professor is going to need to help you write that recommendation. So if you're pursuing neuroscience and you want a recommendation from a neuroscience teacher, ask them in the beginning, you know, is there anything you'd like me to do, you know, outside of class? And here are some suggestions maybe to help you understand who I am as a student and outside of this class as well to help make that recommendation letter stronger. So that's another creative way that you can get on the, under the scope or under the radar of your professor, especially under a big class. Yeah, that's great to hear because I've heard everyone say communication, but no one's ever said creativity before. And I, now that you've explained it, that's definitely really important to make yourself stand out. So Anything really you do ask. that's different is going to stand out. <laughs> yeah, that's great to hear. <laughs> Not to think of different ways to stand out, especially in that 400 person class, but I'm sure I'll think of it. I have some time. <laughs> but I have a very abstract question for you now, and I feel like it's important to address, um, especially now in the 21st century, um, I was wondering what it's like for you to be a STEMinist or a woman in STEM. Um, are there any challenges you face? Or, yeah, what's the journey been like? So, you know, um, hearing this question now, I honestly, I've never been asked to define or even answer a question like that before. So I'm going to be honest here and and say again that I don't know if I've ever considered myself to be a woman in STEM. I just always saw myself as a scientist. And I think I got very lucky in my career that I was never reminded of the fact that I was a woman in STEM. And I think that's what the goal is here, right? At the very end of the day, it doesn't matter, you know, what sex or what gender you come from, you're a scientist at the end of the day. And I got really lucky that I wasn't, I guess, limited in my exposure to things. I didn't feel like I was any superior or inferior to my lab partner, um, Miguel Briones, that I had mentioned before. And like, it just, it wasn't there for me. The obstacles weren't there for me. And I think a lot of it was because of what I did actively with my own hands. I was interested. I promoted that confidence. I promoted that interest. I promoted that motivation in and of myself that it was kind of infectious. To those around me. So it wasn't necessarily ever a topic of consideration or discussion anywhere because it's like, we get it, you're interested in scientists, uh, you're interested in science and you're a scientist, let's just leave it at there. Um, I've gotten a lot of opportunities to do to re research and I don't know if a lot of that has to do with the program that I was initially involved in, which I mentioned before as well, called BP Endure. That could have helped me a lot, you know, in the long run. And that program actually helped me, you know, kind of skip my little masters in between my undergraduate career and my graduate career because I got all of that research out of the way with this program in particular. But for, I guess, women and seminists that are already out there that are, you know, like on that pathway, especially in this century, you know, oftentimes I realize that the barriers that we put up are often self-imposed. You know, if you go in there with that level of confidence that you should believe in, because as a scientist, you should realize that no one should be confident. Because again, we know what we know, and that's it. <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, tomorrow can happen, and all of a sudden, years of research that we have are now undone because this one little fact came out that made everything else null. I promise you, all of the scientists that are in there like 50 years, 40 years into this field still don't know anything. So don't expect to know everything. And if we did know everything, if we did have that level of confidence, you know, going into the career, there wouldn't be a career. Because the whole academic, you know, research career is basically contingent upon the fact that we still have questions to answer. There's still so many unknowns that are out there. So it's okay that you don't know anything. We don't know anything either. And, you know, don't impose that barrier. Oftentimes graduate students will talk about this syndrome and it's I'm missing it in my head right now but um, I think it's called like the imposter syndrome or something I forget but it's where students don't 
always feel like that they belong in the field that they belong in because they just, again, self-imposed barriers. That's, that's hitting their confidence level. And once that starts to merge in, that can become a very, very dark hole very quickly. So just consider yourself a scientist. You know, it's very great that, you know, women have always been a part of science and it's only increasing even more now. And I'm glad that I was able to be a part of that program that now are also allowing minorities to be more and more involved in research. And I think the field is finally catching on. You know, in the very, very beginning, early stages of neuroscience, most of the subjects for both human-based experiments and animal-based experiments were either male subjects or male rats. And, you know, we're kind of moving away from there. We're including different races, different ethnicities. We're including the female sex. We're including different genders now as well, depending on if it's a human-based subject or an animal-based experiment and things like that. So we're slowly catching up, you know, and a lot of our understanding of the field of psychology is also now influencing this in neuroscience. And another way that I can answer that we're definitely moving in more progressive manners is that, you know, oftentimes animal research in and of itself becomes a problem, you know, for many people. And it's totally understandable. And now, at least within the last couple of years, I feel like I might have mentioned this um, in my course as well, we're actually phasing out primate research because with that research that we've conducted with them, we realize that they have too much of a conscience. And that conscience is going to prohibit us from conducting a lot of these experiments ethically. For them. So we're phasing it out. There's no such thing as primate research anymore. And a lot of the research that we've done helped us get to that point. You know, and of course, by introducing now female brains into the mix, we're going to be answering different kinds of questions. So this field is going to be never ending. But I will say, at least from my experience, that it is moving in a much more progressive manner, for sure. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And especially what you said about putting up your own barriers. Um, growing up in a developing country where sometimes women are stigmatized, I've definitely grown up with those barriers. I've been in male-dominated classrooms where I'm the only girl in class. And that definitely you know, influences the way you think. But speaking to incredible neuroscientists like you, during these expert talk series kind of showed me that yeah, it's my self-inflicted barriers and we're moving towards change. And the fact that the change is happening is what's important. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, of now, course. I mean, I you guys get the very lucky opportunity of being that like in between kind of generation. So it really does rest on your shoulders to like kind of show up and be there for yourself 100%. Yeah, we have to bolster that change. And it's comforting to see that Gen Z is doing that. Most of us are striving to bring about that difference. Now I have one last question before we close up today's session, which is if you have any parting words of wisdom for our listeners, and if you could go back in the, into the past, is there anything you change? So parting words of wisdom first. Um, I think I had mentioned it before um, on two different occasions is this idea of being an active participant in your choices and an active participant in your future and making sure that you are involved in the choices that are being made for you. And you're not just like, you know, a salmon fish in the river that's being passively strewn along with the currents of that particular river. And then along with ensuring that you're like an active participant, but know that you also have to be flexible with your plans as well. Because when I had first started my high school career as a psychologist, it was like, therapy is the way, you can't stop me, I'm only going down this route, it's the easiest and the most involved in science I'll ever become. And lo and behold, now I'm in the world of pharmacy, which I never expected to end up in. And when you think about this, whenever you sit down and you know, see yourself envisioning the future, and think about you know you envisioning your future from five years ago. You're not sitting where you're expected to be sitting at all in the middle of this podcast, you know, with me. You and so in that sense, you have to be flexible with your plans. And if you allow yourself to do that, you're going to enter everything with a healthier mindset, and things are just going to fall into your lap um, a little bit more effortlessly in that sense. So definitely be an active participant, but at the same time, be flexible with your plans. Um, and now when you talk about like going back in, in, in time and if there's something that I would change, like is that something on a global level or is that something on like a more personal level? Maybe a more personal level. Okay, so on a more personal level, I will advise myself, you know, going along with the, the words of wisdom I seem to be imparting here, um, 
is I would definitely advise my younger self to kind of like trust the process. And the reason why I say that is, you know, the whole idea, like I've never saw myself as a woman in STEM. I just saw myself as a scientist. I often feel like not being able to trust in the process and wanting to get to places quickly. And once I had my plan and my blueprint set out that I needed to have achieved it by the next day, I think doing that to myself as a, as a younger um, student and as a younger scientist, I feel like I developed maybe some kind of low level of undiagnosed anxiety. And that all like arose because of my lack in my faith that what I was doing was exactly what I needed to be doing. So definitely do the work, but also chill just a little bit, you know, there's so many people out there doing so many different things and everything's going to feel like it's super important you know, to do that, like, hey, you're doing everything that you need to be doing right now. You know, you're in school, regardless of the fact that you were late today or not, you're in school, you're doing the classes, you know, you're involved in the research, that motivation aspect is there. And to listen to not only your brain, but your gut and your heart as well. And again, we've learned, you know, under the cases of chronic stress, all that stuff's connected. And we're learning more and more about the gut as well. So that saying of always trust your gut probably comes from somewhere. You know, um, and it may have a scientific origin in nature. So definitely I would tell myself to trust the process a little bit more and not to be over anxious about everything that needs to be done. Because again, it can get really overwhelming to think to ourselves, hey, I need to stand out. Hey, I need to do this. I need to get recommendations. I need to be better, so on and so forth. But try not to forget about the things that you are doing and focus a little less on the things that you're not doing, because that can also become a very dark hole very quickly. And it's going to prevent you from working adequately the way that you need to for yourself and for your career at the end of the day. Yeah, those are great words. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And that actually brings us to the end of this episode. Thank you, Dr. Kumbakar, for Thank joining you. us. And yeah, thank you for imparting your great words of wisdom. and sharing all your knowledge with our audience.